Good morning, everyone. Um, my name's David. I get to serve as one of the assistant ministers here. Um, youth, hands up. Where are you guys? Jess, put your hand down. <laughs> uh, it's great to have you all here with us as well. We're so excited that you can uh, sit here with us, sit under God's word together um, as, as God's people. Let me commit this time to God. As Steve said, uh, we're going to be doing a bit of a, a heart check this morning. So I'm going to pray for us that God would prepare our hearts to hear from him and that this would not just wash off us like water off a duck's back. So let me pray for us. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that as we come to hear your word this morning, may we mark, learn, uh, inwardly digest, um, reflect on, and be challenged by your word. May your spirit do your work in us this morning. And may we not put any barriers up to you working on our hearts, but may we humbly sit under your word now. Please clear all distractions from our minds and prepare us to hear from our Lord. We pray this in his name. Amen. Uh, and again, also welcome to those of you who are online as well. It's great to know that you are joining us. Well, we're continuing to hear today about how uh, Christ, the risen Christ, continues to reign and how he shows his reign as well. Uh, we're coming to Philip, uh, a person who was chosen by God to wait on tables, but now he's thrust into the spotlight, uh, used by God to grow his kingdom. And our passage that we'll come to in a moment compares two different responses to Philip. We get Simon the sorcerer, a magician, and we get an unnamed Ethiopian treasury official. And as we come to it, like I've been praying, and as Steve was saying earlier, we're doing a heart check this morning. As we see the way that God uses Philip, this needs to direct our hearts away from being tempted by anything flashy, anything extravagant, and direct us towards the true way that he is at work. And we see God at work by his word, in the power of his spirit, on people's hearts. Now, as we see here, our hearts are liable to being tempted away from um, what we might think is quite uh, un unexciting things towards more flashy things. And this is what's inside the church. I'm not talking about being distracted by our Instagram feeds, uh, what's on our Netflix, whatever it might be. Um, there are lots of ways in which, uh, here, even here at church, we can put up barriers that stop God doing his work on our hearts, which is the true way we see Christ reigning um, a couple of these things might be, uh, we might be here today and we might be thinking, I'm going to catch up with that friend and hear how their holiday was. That's a good thing, but it's not the main thing in which Christ shows his reign. Another one, one of them might be, uh, I can't wait until I get to serve my brothers and sisters here at church today. Again, a good thing, but it is not the main thing. The main thing is Christ doing his work in our hearts by his word in the power of his spirit. Uh, we may be here today, we might be thinking, I want to do amazing signs and wonders just like Simon and Philip were doing. Now, yes, the Bible speaks about that, but that is not the main thing. A couple of weeks ago, Steve was sharing with us how we need to make sure that the main thing remains the main thing. And so what is the main thing? It is God working on our hearts by his word in the power of his spirit. And other things might take our hearts off that. We might be seeking attention from others, being able to say, I was at church this week. We might be honoring Jesus with our lips and how people hear us. But yet our hearts might be remaining unchanged. Uh, so we're going to hear from God speak to us now. Uh, Michael's going to come up and speak to us. 
um, or read from God's Word, um, it'd be great if you have your apps open or your Bibles open at Acts chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible, we have a bookshelf up the back. Please put your hand up and someone will bring a Bible around to you. But as we see the way that God is at work by His Word, it'd be great to have God's Word open. There are a couple of hands up, Warren, so if you could take a Bible around, that'd be great. Uh, a couple more hands as well. Keep those hands up and Michael's going to come and read from God's Word. Uh, hello, my name is Michael. And as I noted, we're reading from Acts chapter 8, and the first reading starts at verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man named Simon who practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria, Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share of this, in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he might forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. All right, we're cutting the reading in two today to help with our focus. All right, Philip's encounter with Simon the sorcerer. Simon was someone who was attracted by fame and abilities and getting attention from people and feeling good because of how people spoke about him. And those temptations were the barrier for him, preventing his heart from being humble and repentant towards God. Now, it appeared as though Simon was a genuine follower of the Lord Jesus, that he'd genuinely given his life to Jesus. But we see that for all the show that he put on of following Philip, he remained, he remained someone who was far from God in his heart. And how distressing is it that we may know of, of someone in our lives who may have come to church for years, come to Bible study, but they'd never let God get to their heart. Well, the main thing had not ha happened to Simon's heart either. And so as, as we see his example, it speaks to us. Are, are we happy to, to bring our hearts to God with all its, its wickedness and, and sin? Or are we simply seeking, like he was, the glory, the attention from others? Well, keep that open in front of you. Uh, Philip's ministry... Now, the main thing about Philip's ministry is one thing, preaching the word. That is the main thing in his ministry. 
Jesus' promises to the uh, apostles in Acts chapter 1 is here starting to be fulfilled. They've gone to Jerusalem, and then the apostles are going to be his witnesses now in all Judea, and as we come to today, to Samaria. And Philip's ministry, to be fair, comes with other powerful signs. Impure spirits coming out of many with shrieks. Many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. And quite understandably, there was great joy in that city. This, this must have been incredible things to witness. It would have been amazing to see these things happen. Uh, and repeatedly uh, in, in Acts and other books of the Bible, the Bible tells of these powerful things happening. But they can become a distraction. Notice how Luke wants us to remember that the main thing remains the main thing. Have a look at verse 6. It's on the screen behind me as well. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs that he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. Not what he did, what he said. You see, their focus doesn't end on the signs that he could do. Their focus goes from what he did to what he said. What is the message that comes with these? That Jesus is Lord, the Messiah. Indeed, throughout chapter 8, you may have heard of it a couple of times there, that phrase, preaching the word, proclamation, testifying about Jesus, that comes up time and time again. That is the main thing. God's word doing its work on our hearts by his spirit, that Jesus is Lord. Now, Philip has turned up and he's doing powerful signs and pretty soon it brings me into conflict with Simon the sorcerer. Or it's actually not much of a conflict, it's a, a laying down, Simon sort of gives up. But I want us to notice how Luke describes Simon uh, in verses 9 to 11. Uh, have a look at that there. Verse 9. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city. And amazed all the people of Samaria, he boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. And they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. He seems pretty great. <laughs> he had his own following. The whole city of Samaria, they were all amazed by him. He loved, indeed, to not be humble about it, but to tell others how great he was. I think the expression is he had tickets on himself. He loved himself. He had the ear of all people, the common person in the street, the high person, the high official. Uh, they focused their attention on him. He had all the Instagram followers, lots of DMs from strangers. They praised his name and said, rightly, this one is called the great power of God. I mean, imagine if that was written on someone's name tag this morning. What's your name again? Oh, the great power of God. Okay, put it on your shirt there. And he had a well-established supporter base as well. He'd been, they'd been amazed by and followed him for a long time. Now, the temptation with that might have been, Simon thought, I reckon God thinks well of me. I reckon I'm in God's good books because people say that I am. Well, he was about to lose it all. Because Philip shows up doing things even more powerful than what Simon could do. It might remind you of the magicians uh, in, in Exodus and when Moses and Aaron turn up and the magicians give up, they say, we can't do this. Now, amazing as that was, Philip could care less about that. That wasn't the main thing. Have a look at verse 12. Men and women believed and were baptized as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Very easily, Philip could have been tempted to think, God thinks well of me because look at all the powerful things I can do. But always through Acts, the signs come with a message, the message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. For Philip, there was far more important work to do, proclaiming the good news of forgiveness. 
And even Simon, we're told, believed and was baptized. But notice the difference. Uh, Earlier in verse 6, the crowds um, paid close attention to what Philip said. Uh, But here in verse 13, as Simon followed Philip everywhere, Simon was astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. You see, he was not focusing on the message, but on the abilities of the messenger. And as Simon witnesses the receiving of the Spirit by the laying on of hands of Peter and John, he thinks, cool, I can grow my abilities, I can grow my kit bag of skills. And hands over some money and says, give me also this ability so that I too may be able to pass on the Holy Spirit as I lay on hands. You see, Simon was blinded by how can I build up my skills? How can I, you know, I've been trumped by Philip. Well, let's build up my skills. And so see how Peter rebukes him. In verses 21 and 23. Peter says, your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full, not of the Holy Spirit, not of truth, not of wisdom. You are full of bitterness and you are captive to sin. You see, Peter is saying to Simon, I don't care about your money. I don't care about your skills. What matters is that your heart gets right with God. And so Peter says, oh, never mind. Don't worry about that. No, he says, this needs to be repented of. You've got to change. Don't just brush off this as something that everyone else does. You've got to change. Turn your life around, Simon. Now see also how Simon responds to this rebuke. Uh, Peter says, pray to the Lord. But Simon says, could you pray for me? And then Simon, uh, Peter has said to, to Simon, he said, repent of this and pray that God may forgive you. But Simon simply says, Can you pray for me that nothing like this happens? You see, Simon doesn't say, I repent in dust and ashes. I I leave my life of sin behind and I follow in the new way. No, he says, can you make sure that none of this happens to me? His heart has not been changed. His heart has not been changed by that message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And so, brothers and sisters, let me ask us, is this word of God, going to, are you just going to brush it off and not be changed by it? Because there's, there's a great temptation that we can seek after people speaking well of us, that we can seek the attention of being up on stage, And I'm sure I know that our music team, they always make sure that their hearts are right before God before they get up on stage. Are we reading the word, marking it, learning it, inwardly digesting it? Because that's how God is at work. That's how he shows his reign in changing lives from the heart. And let me give you a quick example. Um, We set up our, our... Our home with Christmas decorations yesterday, it was great, but I'm always kind of wondering, is that the main thing? Or are our hearts preparing him room at Christmas? Anyway, pause there. Uh, Michael's going to come up and uh, keep on reading. So we've got that example of Philip and Simon. Now we come to Philip and the Ethiopian. Yes, picking up at uh, verse 26. 
Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chari chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptised them. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and travelled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. All right, so Philip and the unnamed Ethiopian treasury official. Uh, through this example, we, we, we see how we can ensure that the main thing remains the main thing. Uh, in this encounter, uh, it's not a new thing, but it's a true thing. And I'm borrowing that expression from uh, John Chapman. Um, it's, a, it's not a new thing, it's a true thing. The risen Christ at work by his spirit, people reading the scriptures with one another, pointing them to the fulfillment by the Lord Jesus. It's nothing extravagant. It's nothing flashy. It's through the everyday life group. The official has read about the suffering, silent, humiliated servant of the Lord. He has no idea who this is. He needs Philip to, to jump onto the chariot and explain it to him. Now, coming from Ethiopia, he would not be aware of, of Jesus' resurrection or, or what the scriptures meant. And, uh, you know, in contrast to Simon, someone quite flashy who had great powers, the Ethiopian encounters someone quite unflashy, quite unremarkable, someone deprived of justice. Um, the passage that he was reading was from Isaiah 53. It's a famous passage if you get a chance to read it. It would be great to read. But this is the Christ who we preach. And have a look at Isaiah 53. It will be on the screen. Um, I'll just pick out a couple of parts of there. The Christ that we preach in that third line says that he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. No wonder the world cannot understand why we follow Christ. Because there's nothing to attract us to him apart from his glorious resurrection. He had, this eunuch had no idea and so Philip says, cool, let's do some biblical theology. Let me take you all the way through and show you the good news of Christ. And I just thought, like, this is an amazing question for the eunuch to ask Philip in verse 34. He says, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? I mean, don't we just I crave for a question like that? It's just, I could just open the doorway right open. Well, let me tell you about Jesus. This is where heart change happens. Encountering the life of suffering by Jesus on our behalf, in the scriptures and working on our heart. 
And truly, Jesus himself performed some incredible signs and wonders. But they were all pointing to the message, the message that Jesus is Lord, that he reigns. And if we want to tell our friends, our neighbours, our family about Christianity, this is where we need to start, with something very inglorious, with something rather perhaps undesirable. Because if you're here today or online and you don't know about Jesus, let me tell you, it's not going to be a life of glory. It's going to be a life of suffering, of being rejected. I mean, Simon got the wrong idea. He thought, well, if I follow Jesus, I'm going to become more amazing. Well, compare the fact that Luke records Simon's name, but not this official's name. See, from that, we're not meant to remember his name, but remember how he encounters Jesus. He demonstrates the the inquiring seeker who finds life and hope in the pages of Scripture working on his heart. Now, I think it's incredible what happens when they see some water. Uh, And I wonder whether this was a river, uh, a pond, um, a little puddle on the side of the road. But they come along, and it's not Philip who says, well, come on, eunuch, it's time to go and get baptised. The eunuch sees it, and his heart is already telling him, I need to be baptised. I need to go through this. And so he says, look, here is water, Philip. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? You see, he realizes that his heart needs to be cleansed by Jesus' blood. And so he asks, well, what else needs to be done? What else? Is there nothing? Great, let's go. And so this person outside national Israel is now adopted in by faith. And this is the kind of work that we want to see in, in, in us, in all of us. We don't want these pages of scripture to just bounce off you like chucking a tennis ball at a brick wall. We want to see all of us encountering Jesus in scripture because his work is a work that changes hearts. We want to hear of his suffering on our behalf. We want God to lead us away from the temptation of attention-seeking and glory. And this this is why we have church services, so we can all encounter the Lord Jesus together. And that we would bring our hearts to God in repentance and faith and obedience. And friends, this is where life and hope are found. Not in a new thing, but in a true thing. The pages of scripture. Now, as a church, we would love for you to tell us, are we neglecting this heart work? Have we become distracted from the main thing by something else? If we have, please tell us. (laughs) But what about our individual hearts as well? Are there things in our heart that we know are not right before God? Could someone say of us, your heart is not right before God? Will we then say, whatevs? Or will we realise we need to change? Um, A couple of ways this might show itself. Um, Serving. Serving is a great thing, but if it's not getting to people's hearts, if it is not producing repentant hearts, then we've become tempted by something else. It is great to serve, but we want to make sure that we're doing heart work on people. Uh, Do we love when people speak well of us? Does that make us think that we're right in God's eyes? Or do people not know the, true, the, the, the real state of things? Now, are we here today so that we can tell people, I came to church. 
Or are we here today bringing our hearts to God, saying, mold me, change me, take me? Um, when, when, when we serve, are we seeking opportunities that are public? Uh, I remember a friend of mine said that the, that the main way to serve is to preach up front. Or actually, are you quite content with being in the shadows when no one recognises your work, but you know you're doing heart work? Uh, here's something that's, that I particularly am gripped by. Um, do you come here on Sundays looking forward to catching up with your friends? Or do you say to yourself, for the first 10 minutes after the service, I'm going to go and find someone new and introduce myself to them. That's, that's amazing work where you can say, friends, I'm going to, I can see you some other time. This is the time where I can need to be with, with new people and get to know them and make them feel welcome into God's family. There might be other ways. Um, but I'm going to finish this morning uh, with these words from Psalm 139. Uh, you may know these words. Uh, I'm going to finish with this as a prayer. Um, Psalm 139 speaks of God knowing everything about us, and it finishes with these words. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and, and what? See if there is any offensive way in me, and don't touch it. <laughs> Don't go there, God. That's personal to me. How dare you tell me what to do, God? Lead me in the way everlasting. Show me the everlasting way and take me that way. Lead me in the way everlasting. Let's bring this to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, would you search us and see our hearts May we not be too proud to bring our hearts to you. Would you test us and know our anxious thoughts? Father, if there is any offensive way in us, may we not shut that off from you, but would you lead us in the way everlasting and change us so that we can show your reign from our hearts. This we ask so that your name will be glorified in our lives. Amen.